we have a really nice fireside chat between Caitlin Holloway, who's the VP of People and Culture at Reddit, and Lara Schmidt, um, the host of the 21st Century HR podcast and the founder of Amplify. So let's put our hands together and welcome them to the stage. All right, well, thank you for uh, spending some time with us. We know that you've got a lot of good sessions to attend, and you're here with us, and we appreciate that. So before we get in, Caitlin and I are two people who like to keep it real. This is a fireside chat. Do you see a fire? There's no fire. So technology allows us to remedy a lot of things. And this is a surprise to me, folks. Now we have fire. This all right? So, so we're going to have an authentic fireside chat. I'm going to put this right here for all of you. All right? We're all warm and cozy now. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make this great. So we're going we're gonna to get into a lot of stuff over the next 45 minutes. Um, a lot of it is going to be about your career. We're going to kind of get into the evolution of your career, and we're obviously going to spend a lot of time on 21st Century HR and kind of what you're building at Reddit. Uh, and we're also going to have some time for audience Q&A on the back end. So if you have questions, we're going to carve out uh, at least five minutes, hopefully 10. Uh, and we're going to have two runners with Mike. So if you have questions, we will cover those. So let's dig in. Yeah. Let's do it. All right. So you weren't always in HR. No, sir. No. So you, you started your career as a teacher, a, a short-lived career as a teacher. So tell me a little bit about what drew you to that initially and kind of when did you realize that was not for you? <laughs> So technically, uh, I started my career as a camp counselor. Oh, okay. Uh, when I was the ripe old age of 11, uh, forging my own uh, work permit notes. But my first post-college job was teaching. So I, like probably some of you in this room, graduated during that first um, tech.com implosion when pets.com went <laughs> sideways. And uh, I miss those puppets. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I, I graduated when the economy was in the shitter, and I really had dreams of moving to San Francisco and making it big in design, which you, that's another passion you and I share yes. um, on the side. And um, that was not to be. And so I did what any um, smart, able-bodied, uh, lovely, privileged human did, and I moved back home with my mom, mm -hmm. um, who was a public school teacher in Stockton, California. And uh, yeah, California was giving out teacher credentials like... Uh, like free stuff that you don't want um, because there was a teaching crisis. And so, um, so yeah, I, I did the, the path of least resistance and I, I went in, I became a first and second grade teacher first. Um, and I, I graduated a little bit early, so I was only 21 years old um, teaching babies. So babies teaching babies. And yeah. uh, it, was, it was hard. I, I had a class of 34 students. Uh, all of them were English as a second language and I, um, Oh, single mono language individual, uh, and they all had learning disabilities. And it was easily the hardest job I've ever held. Um, I inherited a classroom from a teacher who had a mental breakdown and she, she split on these poor kids. And so I went in and oh. it was mayhem. I also realized in the first week as I was sobbing at my children as they were sobbing at me uh, why she had a break. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so I finished up that school year with them, and then I asked to be bumped up to high school so that I didn't have such a big responsibility of molding young little minds. Um, but I, I never went into it because I thought that that was something I wanted to do. Although I found great fulfillment, I felt the responsibility was too great. Um, and I didn't want to set these children up for failure later yeah. in life. I said, I'd rather get them when they're already broken. <laughs> I'll get them later. <laughs> we'll take the high school kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, flash forward. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I went up to the high school kids. And that was, was better. But I, I knew that I wanted to be in San Francisco. So yeah. boogie on out. Got it. Well, and just a quick read of the room. Um, how many of you are in recruiting right now? Oh, my we're goodness. At, we're at LinkedIn. That's not surprising. Shocker. How many of you are in HR roles not in recruiting? Still a pretty good amount. Um, how many of you aspire to be a CHRO or a chief people officer one day? One you can head. totally. Okay, Pressure, pressure's on. We need to, we need to fill these heads. Uh, okay, so teaching wasn't for you. You left teaching and you found yourself at a bit more of a magical place at Pixar. So what was that? How did you find yourself going from teaching to working at a studio, an animation studio? Uh, well, I would say there were a few common denominators, but in between teaching and uh, Pixar, I had had my run of uh, miscellaneous San Francisco jobs. Um, and I think that really laid the foundation for translating into uh, film. So the, the job that I had actually right before Pixar um, was the one that was the first time in my, my short but 
uh, wily career that I really disliked. Um, and it was a destination career for me, what I yeah. thought. Um, so I was in the advertising business. Um, and I really thought that that was where I wanted to be. Um, and within the first two weeks, I realized that that was not for me. Um, there was a pretty deep values misalignment that I didn't know existed. Um, I remember sitting down on my first day at this agency, and I, I, sat, I turned to the woman next to me, and I was like, hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm new. I'm so excited to be here. And she just turned to me. She did not even like, look away from her computer, and she was like, talk to me. And when you've been here for six months, people don't last long. And I was like, oh, OK. Welcome to advertising. That's not for me. Yeah. Um, so I basically started looking for my next job almost immediately, uh, which felt very uncomfortable. But um, yeah, that, that workplace was the first time that I really um, I, I realized that work was not easy. Um, and it wasn't about the work that you were doing. And so uh, my husband, bless his heart, helped me through a uh, design thinking workshop around like, because I, I really was devastated. I was like, shoot, I've kind of bounced around like a pinball in my career. I, I've become this Jane of all trade, master of none. Um, and, but I'm driven and I want to give something, but I don't know what I have to give. And yeah. so he really helped me kind of work through um, what it was that I wanted to do. So he said, if you don't know what you want to do, why don't you think about where you want to do it? And so. Um, I went through the Bay Area and I found all the companies. This is way back before like real proper internet. Like LinkedIn was maybe, maybe not around. <laughs> Don't want to date myself. You're, um, you're pulling newspapers. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> through the classified, circling my jobs and lipstick. <laughs> uh, no, I, so I, I didn't. Um, Company culture was not a conversation that was happening, uh, yeah. but there were friends and families and networks, the original uh, social network. And so I asked, who, who knows a company that is really invested in learning and development? And again, that wasn't really something that was formalized within organizations yet, but I knew that I wanted to be somewhere that would help me uncover what it was that I was meant to be. And so um, I figured there was a job out there that I didn't know what it was, but would find me somehow. And so, um, so I, I interviewed at Pixar, knowing that that was a place that really fostered um, that culture of learning. And so um, I went. I took a massive title, pay, career, everything cut um, to go work for the best film studio on earth. Um, and I was rejected. <laughs> they said, thanks, but no thanks. We'll keep your resume. And I thought, oh, OK. Talk to you never. Uh, um, recruiters, recruiters, and then we'll keep your resume on file. <laughs> God. So, come to find out, they actually did keep my resume. They called me. It was nine months later. Um, so it was like the gestation period of, of me. I take that back. Them. Recruiters are magical. They, they actually are magical follow through. Creatures. Good job, recruiters. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I was called back, and they said, "We're ready for you. Come on over." I, I quit my job on the spot, which I've also never done. I, I got as close to flipping a desk as my weak little arms could do, <laughs> push the papers off, and uh, hit the, the Bay Bridge and, and went to work in Emeryville. Um, and I joined the company at a really, really, really interesting time. Um, I, I feel very fortunate in my career. I feel like I've been at the right place at the right time many, many times. And so at this point, I either am a very, very lucky individual, or I have somehow have subconsciously created an environment for success uh, for myself. So at any rate, I showed up. Um, the week before the Disney Pixar uh, merger acquisition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was an assistant, so I, I wasn't even just an assistant. I was an assistant to an assistant, which I didn't know oh. existed. Wow. Um, so that was cool. Like the uh, hierarchy of assistants. It, yes, it, it, was, yeah. it was a pretty intense, incredible job. But I, I was supporting, ultimately, um, a group of people and individuals that were responsible for uh, protecting Pixar's culture going into this, uh, this merger. Mm -hmm. and, uh, long story short, I was exposed to um, a lot of the thinking behind how they were building their culture to produce incredible films. And so uh, the, the, the conversations that were being had um, weren't hit you in the face culture, because again, that was not really language that was being used at the time. It right. was about workspace design and how that inspires and lives their, you know, enables their employees to live values through, hey, you know, if we create our conference rooms in the center atrium and make them glass, we want to make sure that our, our leaders are in a space where they can view the people who those decisions being made in that room will impact. Um, you know, putting bathrooms in the center to inspire conversations amongst, you know, many, many different types of employees from different departments so that, you know, we really could live the value, great ideas come from anywhere. Yeah. Um, and that fascinated me. This like the behavioral science and like the intentionality that they were putting behind um, what was so precious to them, because they they fundamentally believed that 
people were the, the reason they were successful. And, and the stories that unfold on screen, you know, it, our, our mission was so simple. Put people in a dark room for 90 minutes and hope they feel something. Like, it's so simple, yeah. uh, but so powerful when you really think about the, the thousands of individuals that bring a story to life. Um, and so it, when you sit through a Pixar film at the end, the credits are forever and ever and ever. Um, and it's such a proud thing to see your name up on screen, knowing that was my fingerprint, or oh, that dog, that was my dog's name. And, and you know, when I was having lunch with so-and-so, that's where that idea came from. Like, there's me. You see yourself in that film. Right. Um, and so they really genuinely believe that. And so they, that, those were the things they wanted to protect when they were going um, to, to start this relationship with Disney. And so I was very, very fortunate to have exposure to those conversations and those ideas, um, not even knowing that that would be ultimately the bedrock of my own philosophies as I grew in my own career. Yeah, I mean, how did the, you know, Pixar is, as, an, as an organization is so known for their, the power of story yeah. and their ability to make you feel something when you're watching. Like, you can't watch a Pixar movie and not feel something over the course of that film or multiple things. Like, they're just, they can pull it out of you. And how did that kind of being in such a story intensive environment, how did that translate into later aspects of your career? Like what, what aspects of story apply to your role today at Reddit? Oh, absolutely. Um, folklore, yeah. internal folklore is, is one of my uh, favorite secret weapons uh, for good. Mm -hmm. um, the, the ability to bring to life uh, the, the ethos of your company and, and how it is, the DNA, extracting the DNA of, of culture as opposed to just being you know, values printed on uh, you know, the wall or a sticker or the, the swag you get your first day as a new hire. Right. Storytelling and folklore is how you bring your culture to life and you demonstrate behaviors and values and say, this is what we stand for. Right. Um, so I, I've, I've taken so many, um, so many notes from the Pixar handbook over the years, uh, but definitely embracing folklore um, and internal storytelling um, as a mechanism to, to help drive change um, and to instill the, the right behaviors um, to produce beautiful things at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you left Pixar, you found yourself from there at Clout in your first HR role. So how did, I think you were, were you a script supervisor at, at Pixar, how did you go from script supervisor at Pixar to head of HR at Clout? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder that myself sometimes. You still ponder that? Is that still like, <laughs> yes. fun? yeah. Once again, I, I, I would say uh, fortune smiled upon me. Um, I, so yeah, I, I, I had been at Pixar for five years. It takes five years to make a film, typically, uh, at that studio. And I remember being told um, very early in my career there by Ed Catmull, um, you know, it takes five years to make a film. And if you haven't sorted out what it is that you want to do by the end of five years, because um, I'd shared with him, like, yeah. I, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And he said, well, this is the perfect place to figure it out. Um, so I bounced around the studio, and I got to play in all different teams, different departments, um, and each one was more exciting than the last. Um, but he said, if, if you haven't really nailed it after five years, I, I, I want you to come and tell me, uh, because I will have failed you. And so it was just before my fifth anniversary, and I proudly marched up to his door and knocked, and I handed him an envelope that was my resignation, because I formalize my resignation, yes. I, I must, I'm quitting, and this is why. Uh, <laughs> because they had an incredible university program um, where they allowed people from all over the studio to learn different types of, of trade um, or interests. Like, I mean, they had fly fishing, like, sure, great, do that. Um, I took a writing um, children's book story class, and over the course of my last year at the studio, um, I was working with the storyboard artists and different people who um, had published different versions of, of stories for children. Um, and I, I found a passion in it. And so I, I kind of had pulled that little curious thread and ultimately got a book deal with Simon & Schuster to go write a tween novella. And so I was very proud to tell Ed that I was going to go be an author of children's books. And thank you, but I've had my time at yes. Pixar. Goodbye. <laughs> um, and so I left. Um, head held very high, uh, very romantic ambition. Got home, opened up my, uh, my you know, Microsoft Word. Uh, that's not a plug, but, you know, I, I opened up my screen to type. <laughs> thank um, you, Microsoft. Yes, thank you, such Microsoft. Making wonderful word processing tools. <laughs> um, and and I, I, I hit a block. I had nothing. No, the, the words would not come. They, it would not flow in the way that it was in my, my spare time and free time when I was at the studio. Um, so I called my mentor down at Disney, and I was like, oh, my God, have I made a terrible mistake? Do I need to go back with my tail between my legs? And she said, no, what you're suffering from is writer's block. It's a real thing. Um, you miss people. That's your creative well. 
Um, and so I, I got into a conversation with her about what inspired me and, and the kind of environment that I wanted to be in before I went back and, and begged for my job back. Um, and she said, well, you know, my boyfriend just got his Series B. Um, I said, what, what the hell is a Series B? <laughs> she said, well, and she, she explained to me the, the uh, framework for Silicon Valley. And she said, he has this little company called Cloud. I think he'd trade you a little bit of that, that Pixar fairy dust for a desk, and you, maybe you'll find your inspiration again. Um, I'd never looked back. So I, I was an employee, I don't know, 21. It was very, very, very early. Um, and I found myself sitting not only at the executive table, you know, representing a lot of operational roles, but ultimately at the boardroom. Um, and as we grew, I gave my hats away. It was a really, like, it was the fastest, slowest evolution I've ever been a part of. Uh, I didn't realize. And one day I woke up and I was like, oh my god, I'm an HR lady. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, was, it was an interesting discovery, but one that I'm very pleased and, about. And there you were. And there you were. There what, uh, do you remember your cloud score? I, uh, well, I mean, at what point? Well, I mean, at, OK, <laughs> the, your apex, your, your top cloud score. Top ever, I was 81. Oh, OK. Yeah. We're, we're in the presence of an 81, everybody. For those of you internet nerds who remember Clout back in the day. You're too young. <laughs> uh, you might be. We're so old. Um, all right. Let's, <laughs> let's talk a little bit more about Reddit. So obviously, you've been, you've been to Reddit. You moved from Clout over to Reddit. What initially drew you to Reddit? What, what was it about the company that, that you know, kind of pulled you away from Clout into a new organization? Yeah. I, um, well, it was interesting. I, um, so I had been a Redditor. Yeah. Um, I had been a user of the product uh, socially, like kind of informally for, for many, many years, um, being a child of the internet. It was natural. Um, every great cat meme that was ever created was birthed on Reddit. Um, but I really became a Redditor. Like I, I really found my home on, on the platform um, after the birth of my first child. And I... Uh, it, it, it was an interesting thing. So my, my oldest, his name is Luca, he just turned five, and so this was five years ago to give you a, a time reference. Um, Luca had uh, uh, some, some challenges when he was born, some health challenges, um, and they were not easily diagnosable. But the, the short version is, is we had a really hard time feeding. Um, and, and given the, my upbringing and my family and my appearance and my commitment to healthy living, uh, I was convinced that that would not be an issue or a challenge for us. And so I was like, I thought I was like meant to bring back like whole towns from war and famine. Like I don't, I'm made to do this. Right. Um, and we weren't successful. And so uh, he was losing weight at a pretty dramatic clip. Um, they, they wouldn't release us from, from the hospital. Um, and it was devastating as a first time mom. I mean, you know, as a parent, like yeah. those, those early days are um, everything matters. Every minute, every second counts. Um, as, as does every ounce of that little baby being. And so, um, you know, while on Facebook and Instagram, I was posting about this beautiful, I'm a mother now, and here are my totally not staged, brand new mom pictures where <laughs> I look totally decent. Um, and just talking about this overwhelming love that I was experiencing, meeting my baby for the first time, um, I was really struggling. Um, and I, I, was, I didn't know if it was postpartum, I didn't know uh, if it was just simply this fixation with, with his health and, and helping him to gain weight. But um, the fact of the matter is, is I found my, my home on Reddit because I, that was this one space I could be my authentic self under, you know, I didn't have to have this perfectly polished version of me. I was, I, and I found it just by Googling. I'm like, what about this? What about that? What is this? And I, I kept landing in these subreddits around parenthood, around breastfeeding, about um, health issues. Mm -hmm. And um, ultimately, uh, Reddit was the one that diagnosed Luca with, with the challenge that he had. Um, they, they, there was a mom, I remember her, and she, I've, I've never met her, I probably will never meet her, but she was like, take a picture of your son's mouth, send it to me. I did, and she was like, it's this, this, and this. You need to go in, you need to demand this, this, and this. Uh, within 24 hours, he'd had a procedure. We were able to feed in 48 hours. Within three days, he had gained, he was back to birth weight. And I mean, in my opinion, I mean, it sounds dramatic. I mean, there, we're fortunate that that was the only issue that we had, but. In my opinion, Reddit saved my baby's life. Yeah. So like, it, I, I knew the power of the platform. Right. I knew the power of community. Um, and I also knew the power of, of this uh, unfiltered version of yourself. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's a long story to say, like, I believed in it. Yeah. But what was happening uh, with Reddit Inc. at the time was a, a really 
different story. Um, it was a company under fire. It was, it was a culture and a team that were, were suffering. They'd had three CEOs in less than a year. Um, they had just invited back the co-founders as kind of a final shot. Um, they were in the news for all the wrong things. Um, and so to be honest, I took the interview because I was curious. I wanted to see behind that curtain so bad. I was like, I know there's, I know there's really good stuff here. Um, as someone who had received value from that community, um, and it, if for nothing else, I just wanted to give poor Steve Huffman a hug. He had just started, and um, he was looking to rebuild his team. And so I went in, uh, again, mostly out of morbid curiosity, um, and I fell in love. I realized that the, the team was so misrepresented um, in, in the press and how cruel the media could be. Um, but what I saw more than anything was, was hope. Yeah. There, there was a lot of spirit. There was a lot of commitment. There was a lot of loyalty to the, to the users and to the platform and to the mission that I had already felt before even starting. Um, and I saw a team that, that was really open to and were longing for their own sense of community and their own identity. So it, it was a, a no-brainer. Interesting. So, I mean, it's interesting that you had such a deep personal connection to the brand, the platform, before you even showed up. Um, I think that that, you know, for those of you that work, to, work at big brands, you may have an, an understanding of the brand on the consumer side, but to have that kind of a personal connection that runs deep and then and actually have the company be somewhere you wanted to work, <laughs> that, totally. that's powerful. The, the morbid fascination didn't turn out to be all morbid. There was enough <laughs> uh, actual fascination there. Um, so for, I, as the room, there's a lot of recruiters here. Um, you've been you know, going through kind of steady growth. You're getting ready to kind of kick into a next phase of growth at Reddit. How is your recruiting team structured to support kind of Reddit's hiring needs? Yeah. Um, so, you know, Reddit is, I think, currently like the fourth largest website in the US, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is no small potatoes. Um, but we were only 75 people when I was hired almost four years ago. Um, so we really were just like a bunch of people almost in a basement. I, I likened it to like the 13th and a half floor uh, in being John Malkovich, where you, I walked in and was like, well, what's happening here? Uh, we were itty bitty. Um, and so today we're around 550. So that's moderate growth over yeah. you know, a relatively short period of time. Um, but transforming a company from you know, 75, and then every time you double in size, you, you are a new company, truly. Um, I feel like I've lived 10 lifetimes at Reddit. Um, and we're about to embark on this, this next chapter of growth, uh, which is really exciting. So our recruiting team, I, so technically, uh, our first recruiter and first people hire started, I think, a few weeks before I did. Um, and uh, he was a recruiting coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, and I walked in and I was like, hey, cool, so what's your ATS? And he was like, yeah, we don't have anything. Yeah. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you and me, pal, we're going to do this. And so, um, Excel. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we, I mean, they, they had outsourced everything. And so, you, you know, everything from recruiting to compliance and every other function that rolls up under our people and culture umbrella today, um, everything was outsourced. And so being able to build recruiting from the ground up quite literally um, with a, a long-term people first, culture first approach uh, was a real privilege. It, I, you know, usually you inherit something, or yeah. you know, there's this preconceived notion of what something should be or should look like. Um, and so we we had a lot of fun. We've had a lot of fun in those early days building. Um, in in this, you know, we're Reddit. We're we're allowed to be different. I think that's one of the beauties of having you know, there's this kind of the, being in that that unpolished space. We we really had the opportunity to do things that were right for us. Um, and so it's changed a lot. That's a long way of saying it. it has changed a lot over the years. And I think that we finally are kind of maturing into a company um, that has to adopt and um, adhere to some maybe more uh, traditional uh, team structures and things like that. Yeah. So, so yeah, we, we have um, you know, our tech recruiting team, our business recruiting team, uh, recruiting programs and operations, which by the way, I am currently looking for a head of. So if any of you know anyone fantastic, <laughs> Hiring plug. We're in a room full of recruiters. Hey. What, what, is, what is the role hey, again? Hey. In case people miss that, what, what, what is the role you're hiring now? It is uh, the head of recruiting operations and program. Okay. So. In San Francisco? In San Francisco. Okay. There or you New go. York. Or, or New LA. York. I'm open. You've got options. I'm open. Um, so, yeah. So, we, we have the, the you know three kind of traditional branches of the business. Okay. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I want to kind of start getting into just, I think you've, you've definitely embraced a lot of 21st century HR concepts and approaches when building out your team. And one of the things that you did that I thought was really interesting is when you came in um, and it came to trying to design the benefits 
structure and packages. Um, you did a listening tour. Uh, you, you went and you traveled to every office. You had conversations. Tell me a little bit more about that. Why was it important to you to, you know, especially at an early stage as a new HR executive, kind of take that approach to designing benefits? Um, so it's actually interesting. I didn't do it initially um, for benefits. Okay. Uh, that, that kind of has been part of our story that's been told recently. Um, but I, I really did the listening tour to get to know the company culture. Um, and it's something that I, I do um, I, I do on like an annual basis now, but I think that being in touch with who your company is, the, the DNA of your culture um, changes so much over time. And unless you pause and kind of take stock of what it is that, that you are building and how you're building it together, um, you're, you're gonna miss out on being able to kind of harness some of that energy. And so uh, my, the very first thing I did, I mean, like I said, we were only 75 people. Yeah. Um, and so it was easy. Um, I literally sat down with every single employee and, and I asked them the same questions. Um, and the first one was, who are you? And uh, I, I'm going to answer the question you didn't ask, if that's okay yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> please. Um, only because I think that that, that has been the, the foundation of every program and um, every policy that, that we've built is the thing that surprised me most in this listening tour with every single employee is nobody had an answer to that question. Who are you? When I went to Pixar, I knew before I even started. I was a Pixarian. Yeah. If you work at Facebook, you know, Facebooker, a booker. You know, the, everyone, every great culture with intention behind it. You have an identity, you have a shared identity, um, the sense of belongingness. Um, and so I was confused when I got to Reddit because I was like, so you're Redditors, obviously. They're like, no, those are our users. I said, okay, well, who, who are you? No one had an answer to that question. So I said, okay, brought everyone together. We, um, we had a, a series of different brown bags um, to extract our, our cultural DNA, our identity, to really say like, if you are going to belong somewhere, yeah. You need to know who you are. You need to know who the collective we is. Um, and so that's where we extracted our values. That's where we extracted our, our sense of self um, and togetherness was really through that. And, and in that kind of like cultural anthropology, we also um, were able to document our history. So Reddit at that point was a 10-year-old company. Um, and so much had happened, good, bad, ugly. Um, and none of it was documented. Yeah. It's like, hey, gang, we're going to repeat a lot of mistakes. <laughs> unless we document this. And so um, it, was a, it was an incredibly fascinating um, experience. I, it took a quarter, and we went through the whole thing. And by the end of it, we actually produced some, uh, some artifacts of, about who we were, how we got there, the things that we were most proud of, the things that we were you know, most anxious about, all of those things. And they, that really helped dictate not just our kind of cultural roadmap um, and how we wanted to build moving forward together. But it was really, I mean, it impacted our product. It impacted the way we built our leadership team, um, the way we reorganized ourselves after that. It, so it, it really changed the way we were building. Um, it brought a lot of intention to it. Um, yeah. So part of that, to get back to your question, was around benefits. Yeah. Um, and we, we had incredibly generous benefits. I inherited a great um, uh, kind of package. Um, but it was kind of all over the place, and I, I didn't understand, and I was like, well, are you using this? And, and people used bits, bits and pieces, but it was, it was like bizarrely tailored for as generous as it was. Um, and so what I came away with at the end is I was like, well, shit, can we like unlock a bunch of this value? I'm selling it to you as a recruiter. I'm right. telling you, here's your total comp, and here's the value of your benefits. Um, and people were using like squat, and I was like, well, gosh, if we could just make it flexible, inclusive, and actually support you, and actually be a benefit to employees, our utilization will go like probably way higher. So I, I had a thesis, and they let me play. And um, lo and behold, now we don't have a gym stipend anymore, but we have a wellness benefit. So if you find your wellness in the sea as you surf in the morning, go ahead and get your surfboard shaping class on the books. Like, who, who am I to say that it needs to be, you know, 24-hour fitness or Equinox or I'm going to get another plug in here, yeah. you know. It, so you should be able to define what wellness is. Right. Well, I think that that flexibility is something that you're definitely seeing more of in modern HR functions, right? It's, it's with, with the, how the companies approach benefits, um, how they approach things like uh, even perks like family leave, right, and, and making them more less gender-based and more gender-neutral and being more open to who takes what and why. And I think from a, from a you know, standpoint of leave, I know one of the topics that's also really important to you that was kind of driven from this is belonging 
And I think that's another element in, in 21st century HR is really the conversation is starting to evolve from diversity to inclusion and belonging, right? And so I'm curious to get your take. Like, what does belonging feel like? When you're, when you're in an environment yeah. that you really feel, as an employee, like, what does that feel like to an employee? I, this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, and I think that one of, um, you know, give, given my, my work history and having the, the wonderful opportunity to, to really study um, what that felt like um, at Pixar, they just did such an incredible job. I, I knew I belonged. I knew that I could be myself. I knew that um, I, I was so proud. The, the sense of pride that I had um, of just being an employee was, was really immense there. Um, the relationships, the connections that I made, the, the lifelong friends that, that I experienced um, to this day from that, from that culture, um, I think that that was a great foundation for me. But I, what has become more interesting to me um, as I've matured into my career, um, the product really does affect our, our thinking. Um, and if you are a real embedded business leader, um, as you should be in the people function, no matter your role, uh, let that help influence and inform the way you build. Um, because every company culture is different, right? right. Um, and so the thing that I've really been um, excited about, like jazzed about every morning, getting up as I'm, I'm unwrapping this little um, gift that is Reddit, is the, really the power of community. And we do it so well online. And so it is my, my deep privilege to be able to translate that to Reddit Inc. Yeah. And to say, OK, we know what a healthy, thriving community looks like. We know what a toxic community looks like, because we have all of them. <laughs> um, and so one, one of our principal beliefs is um, we, we police um, behaviors, not beliefs. Mm. Um, and that's what we do online on our, on our platform. Yeah. Um, and that has translated very, very well for us internally. Um, and so as we think about belongingness and we think about um, inclusion and diversity and how we support um, all different parts and all different, different definitions of yourself, you know, there's, uh, there are so many layers to who we are and how we feel that sense of belonging. And I, I think that one of that is that external identity of that, that, yeah, I'm really proud to work at the company that I work for. It doesn't matter if you're two people or you know, 200,000 people, having that sense of pride going to work every day, that, that's the motivator, right? Then there's the, the kind of closer to home identifier that you show up to work and you're proud of your function, you're proud of your role, you know that you're having an impact, you love your colleagues, or you at least know how to communicate with them in a way that helps move the business forward so you're, you're really committed to that mission together. Um, and then there's that, that little kind of messy, juicy nuclear that is you. You're, you're yeah. sitting there in the middle saying, OK, so yes, I am you know, fill in the blank. I am, I am Caitlin. I'm in this executive role. I'm a woman. I'm a mother. I'm a really, you know, I'm into hip hop. I, really like sneakers, like there are all of these things that make you you. Um, and some things are superficial and some things are profoundly personal. Yeah. Um, you know, and to give a space, the thing that I think we do so well on, on the platform is give people space to be all of those things. But internally, give them a space to do that that's safe. Yeah. And so how, how do we do that? You know, whether it's through its, you know, an employee resource and interest group um, and creating the, the space for self-governance. How do you want to show up in the world? Um, and each one is different. They're all just like these little micro cultures, um, little subreddits yeah. uh, running around. And so how do, how do you support that? And how, how do we in this ecosystem, in, this, in the, the economy um, that we've created, how do we support that? Because, you know, we're having conversations at our companies for the first time. Um, that haven't ever happened before, just because yeah. of the lay of the land. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's an interesting time to be in your seat as an HR executive because we are having conversations in HR that um, well, you're right, we haven't had before, and they're deep, and they're personal, and and they matter. And so I think it's not about um, you know should we offer this variation of this benefit or not. It's stuff that impacts people's lives in a, in a significant way. Um, one of those is leave, is, is parental leave, yeah. and so. You know, that's a topic I know you've been out front on for, for quite some time. I know Alexis uh, Reddit's you know, founder had an uh, op-ed in the New York Times where he kind of credited you for helping shape his views around parental leave. Uh, and I'm, you know, as, we, as we look at 21st century HR, part of that is busting old notions of work oh, right. and old notions and kind of calling bullshit on how things used to be. And a mantra that is a legacy mantra is that you had to choose. You know, do you be a good parent or do you be a valued employee? Can you be uh, an, an executive 
or can you be a mom mm -hmm. or a dad? And mostly on mom. It's a very gender-sided conversation. And I think we're both here to say that's bullshit, A. Oh, bullshit. And B, how has becoming a mom made you a better executive? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I would say time management, first and foremost. Yeah. You, you learn to prioritize real freaking fast, <laughs> <Right. laughs> real fast after the birth of a child. Um, and so I, I would say patience is another one, um, empathy is another one, but, but really that being able to, to do more with less. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it, it doesn't mean, you know, you're, when you have a child, your world changes. Um, and, but the time-space continuum doesn't. Yeah, right. <laughs> so you, you need to figure out really fast how to become efficient with your time and how to prioritize your, your time. Um, it's also helped me be more present um, at home and at work. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm sitting and I'm, I'm dealing with an employee who's having a, a difficult time, I can be there with them. Yeah. Right? Because I know that nothing else matters for them in that moment. Um, for as much as, you know, when my, you know, 18-month-old, you know, has fallen down and he just needs a hug. It's, it's no, I mean, it's not that simple, but it is at the end of the day. So yeah. learning how to be present, learning how to be patient, um, and some wicked time management. <laughs> time management for any parents out there is an indispensable skill. Um, all right, so we're going to, before we open up to audience Q&A, we're going to shift gears a little bit and do uh, something that I like to call the lightning round. So the lightning round uh, is going to be a series of rapid fire questions. You have 30 seconds or less to answer, or I will shock you with an invisible buzzer. Excellent. Are you ready? Yeah, so remember when I said I was good at time management? Yes, all right, now, now we're going to test that. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, what was your favorite job, of course, not including Reddit? Mm, clout. Clout, okay. Uh, your least favorite HR buzzword? Uh, there's so many. Uh, synergy. Oh, synergy. <laughs> True story, the very first company I created as a consultant was called Synergistic Stop Solutions. It. <laughs> Synergistic solutions. My <laughs> wife pays the shit out of me. She still does. She's very smart. Um, cool. Okay, favorite HR <gasps> discipline? Oh, um, to be honest, I think it doesn't exist quite yet or so formally. Yep. Um, it is this intersection. I'm going to screw this up because I'm anxious about the timing. Um, there, there is something in this like coaching with context. So it's like a little bit of development mixed with just like the, the behavioral science of Tetrising humans in yeah. an organization. That doesn't exist. I've made that no, up. No, it's like an organizational architect. Yeah. Uh, ooh, you should. But with like coaching. Just write that but down. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, I hacked your Spotify playlist. What would I find? Mm, embarrassing. Uh, I'm going to date myself instantly. Um, there's a lot of 90s alt rock, like Counting Crows and icky stuff like do, that. Do, 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 do. We're going to get into that a little bit. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, but but uh, but side by side with Tupac. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, my yeah, my husband and I. Our song is uh, hit, uh, me and my girlfriend. Huh. Uh, I, I then, like I like the juxtaposition there. And then him up. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, favorite TV show. Hmm. Uh, okay. So I'm. Uh, can I give you two? One is we'll like now, yeah. and one is like but like of all time. Yes. Uh, both are terrible answers. I'm currently binge watching Schitt's Creek. Uh, yeah. Which is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and and friends is timeless. It's uh, so good. It 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 stands the test of time. It does. Sorry. <laughs> You're I'm passionately basic. advocating for friends. <laughs> uh, okay, fill in the blank. The key to great HR is. Mm. Synergy. <laughs> Synergy. <laughs> uh, patience. Uh, patience. Yeah. Uh, if you weren't in HR, what would you be doing? Well, I already told you I tried and failed at being a, an author, so I think that's a push. <laughs> um, I think in a weird another world, uh, I would love to race cars. Race cars? I think so. All right. <laughs> Don't test me on it. I, <laughs> I will not. Uh, favorite subreddit? Oh, there are so many. Um, you, you, I mean, you can't go wrong with toddlers being assholes, no. uh, which is, is yeah. one of my, I, that one is just kind of personal at my life stage. Um, dad jokes is always really good. I, I really like the parenting subreddit if you didn't, if you didn't <laughs> get it. There's a theme. I'm yeah. up on your theme. Yeah. Uh, biggest career mistake? There are so many. Hmm. What should I choose? Uh, 
I've made a, I've made a lot of mistakes, Lars. Uh, I would say this can be part confessional if you need. I, I was going to. Oh, say, it's thirty yeah. seconds. It's late yeah. now. So yeah. gonna... <laughs> can we put the partition up between <laughs> us really fast? Um, I remember once I. Um, Hip chat had just come out. Slack didn't exist yet, uh, and I was in. We had an upcoming termination that was involuntary, um, and there was a little bit of a debate as if we were going to do this termination or not. And I had some personal thoughts on it, and I thought that I was typing to my CEO, and instead I typed to internal at, uh, and instantly. Ooh ran around the office closing computers, unplugging things as if that was going to make it disappear forever. Um, luckily, the office was fairly quiet that day and only about 20 people saw, but it was devastating. Luckily, I was not super unkind, but I definitely was not my like polished view. Yeah. It was, a, it was, un, it was ugly. That's, yeah. That's, I don't do group chats you, you, anymore. You, you might be reliving a little trauma after yeah. that one, which I don't understand. Sorry. Uh, okay, you could be any superhero who would you be and why? Okay, so uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, anyone? One of the better Avenger movies, Mantis. So uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not picking her because she's a woman, although that's cool. Uh, being a woman's super cool. Um, <laughs> uh, she, she's an empath. Um, and I've, I was told um, at a very young age by my dad that that was my superpower. Mm -hmm. um, and then when Guardians of the Galaxy came out, I was like, Holy shit! It exists. It's like a real thing. It, 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 you know, I don't want to see through walls. I've never had a flying dream. I'm not interested. But uh, Mantis can touch you and take away your pain or take away your feelings, so that your mind can relax um, and you can focus. Mm -hmm. And so, I think I just think that's super cool. So I, I would want to be Mantis. Okay. Yeah. That is a cool one. Uh, okay. Last question. What is the best part of your job? Oh. Okay. I can't say the people because that's. Bleh. Um, touche. Um, I, I've always measured secretly my success um, in this function based on the number of lasting relationships I've created and the number of babies produced, <laughs> which I'm not saying as an HR leader I want everyone to hook up. Uh. Um, but what I'm saying is I, I really, like, some of my favorite moments are, you know, going to a wedding and seeing like the crew, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are people who stay connected to each other throughout, you know, it, it lives beyond one work experience. Yeah. Um, and like, I mean, gosh, I've been in this field now for almost a decade and I have interns that I introduced, you know, 10 years ago who now have, you know, a child and they're married. Like, like how incredible is that? Like, it's so easy to get caught up in our, in our daily lives and the, the work that we're doing. And it doesn't matter how much you love what your product is and, and the people that you're even doing with it in the moment. Um, this is about creating an experience. This is not an employee experience. This is a human experience. Um, and to be able to take that and translate that and see that come to life for other people is, is profound for me. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's very cool. Um, all right, we have a few minutes for Q&A. So we've got two mic runners. I see one hand up here. You're, you're the lucky number one. Um, so if we can get, can you put your hand up high so we can get a mic over to you? Uh, and I know we don't have a ton of time, so we'll try to keep these pretty tight if we can. Hi, I have a quick question for you. Um, I'm hoping to be a CHRO or EVP of talent in the next couple of years. So what advice would you want to give somebody like me? Well, congratulations. This sounds like a great path. Having a personal OKR or KPI um, is the, the first step, right? So being able to articulate what you want um, is, I mean, you, you're already halfway there. Um, get acquainted with the business. I think that the function can be learned at your own pace and at your own time, but a lot of it's actually on the ground when you're, when you're in it and you're doing it. I mean, like I said, I've been doing this for, for 10 years in this particular function. I'm still learning every single day. Um, so that, like the, the, the aptitude will come, but get very, very acquainted with the way a business works. The most powerful thing that you can do in a people leadership role um, is not compliance, it is not recruiting, and yes, that is what we do all day. Uh, but really, it, it's being that, that powerhouse that you are one of the few functions that actually has the visibility into the entire organization outside of the CEO. Um, and so being able to provide insights that are connected to 
business goals, uh, you know, learning how to operate with a board, uh, that is where you will actually have the largest impact. And so the, your business acumen, like really study up on that. And when you get into an organization, be curious. Make sure that you carve out that time and you, you get the time with people that are the various business functional leaders because it's so easy to get caught up in the, the grind and the, the garbage of every day that is like your tactical job. Um, create the space for you to, to get acquainted with the business. Yeah. Any other questions? We've got one right up here. Hi, thank you. Um, my organization is about 1,300 uh, employees and we need to kind of go beyond just what is our culture, what's the mission statement, and kind of have that values-based approach. How do you, when you get the leaders of your organization into a room and really define what that is, how do you create action items out of those? What, what do some of those look like? First step, get it out of closed doors. This is not a leadership situation. Like, yes, culture is, comes from the top. It also comes from the bottom. Um, so, you know, Lars and I were talking about the listening tours. Um, create those work groups. Uh, get input from, from other parts of the organization because I promise you if, you, if you establish the values and the practices and, and the um, aspirational and the inspirational at the leadership level and then you try to roll them out, it is a much harder path and you getting that buy-in um, is, is sometimes damn near impossible at scale. Um, it's easier when you're smaller, right? It's, everything is easier when you're smaller. Um, but at, at your company size, um, you have to get the involvement and the, the buy-in from the team. So get their input, have those open conversations, um, ask what they're, you know, ask about hard things. Like if you were the CEO, if you were in my role, how would you prioritize diversity and inclusion? What are your diversity goals? What do you think we should be focused on? Um, get those, those working groups and, and take those, those inputs, then go up to the leadership level and say, the people have spoken. This is where we should be focusing our energies. Come with your recommendations. And then what happens from there is a lot easier um, than, than the top down. Yeah. Do we have one more? Yeah, we got one, uh, one more back over here. Do you want to put your hand up? Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Hi, Caitlin. Hello. My name is Kanisha. I'm a recruiter at a mid-sized tech company in New York. I have a lot of friends that are in HR functions across New York City as well that are in high growth phase companies. What happens when you feel your company culture shifting and it's not a positive shift and um, could potentially be due to some of the recent hires? Um, how do you ladder up that communication if you're an individual contributor? Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's a hard question. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I, I think, I think one of the more um, difficult lessons I've learned over you know, my tenure in this role really has been around the notion of evolution and embracing change. Um, not all change is bad, even if it feels different. Um, so try approaching that, that thinking um, from the, oh gosh, the culture has shifted maybe in a bad way. Um, I've learned to actually erase that from my, my vocabulary, even if I personally have been frustrated with the way things have gone or it's not in the image that, that I would have wanted to build. Um, but really looking at that as an opportunity to say, you know, the, these people have been hired for a reason. I mean, most of you in here are recruiters. They're, you, know, you are the ultimate filter for who you invite into your organization. Um, and as your company grows and changes, you know, you're inviting in people that have different skill sets and, and different philosophies. Um, because you know, what, what got you here won't get you there, right? And so when you're 75 people or 50 people versus 500 people versus 5,000 people, um, you, you look for different um, profiles, right? You, you search for different things. Um, and sometimes when you have that kind of like blitz scale effect where you, you just have done like a massive hiring and you're like, oh shit, this feels not like how it did, all it is is a paradigm shift. It's saying, okay, it doesn't feel like how it used to, but how do you embrace what it is? Um, and so, like I said, th this is a, a hard learning lesson, and I mean, I'm experiencing this right now in my own culture um, of, of shift and change. And so I think by approaching it from a place of curiosity as opposed to a place of like, control and like, ah, but I know it should be like this. I know it should look like this. I mean, I, I catch myself even in my own board meetings and executive meetings and even team meetings where I sit and I say, ah, like, 
But that's not what's best for the business. And I say that all the time when I, I'm trying to hide my, my cultural frustrations. It's not right for the business. Um, well, why not? And when you, I think when you open up your language and your, um, your perspective on what is right and wrong, um, you'll find some pretty beautiful things in there. Um, so I think that, again, inviting people into the conversation and asking questions uh, really, really changes your, your outlook on it. Um, and then identifying, I, I mean, I know this sounds so, so cliche and silly, but like use those engagement surveys, find that data. Because what happens is sometimes maybe someone who's been with a company for a longer period of time will think that maybe something isn't quite right or we aren't on the right, right path, um, but your engagement survey will come out okay. So that's saying like, hey, the organism feels pretty good about this. So think about the, the many, not the few. Um, but if, if that's inverse and you're looking at engagement score um, or an engagement even sentiment that is, is maybe lopsided, double click on why. Um, so asking, so maybe as an individual contributor, you aren't managing that, that, that survey function, or maybe you don't even have a survey. That's a huge assumption. Um, ask, why not? Or ask to see the data, or say, hey, what are we doing about you know, X, Y, or Z, or what was our lowest sentiment, or may I? do a survey, whatever, the, you know, whatever phase you are. Um, I'm happy to talk with you afterwards. I feel like I'm getting very tactical. But point being, um, shift your perspective and to curiosity, and I think you'll find a lot more. And then invite in the, the data. The data exists. Yeah. All right, well, I think we're up on time. Uh, I want to thank all of you for spending the last hour with us. We know you've got a lot of choices, and you chose to spend it with us, and we appreciate that. And we appreciate you, and I appreciate your wisdom. So thanks so well, much I for coming on. Thank you, Thank you, guys.